Thank you very much for the warm introduction, and um, we are very happy to um, give you uh, insights on the topic tokenization of carbon credits, especially as regards the regulatory um, consequences. And yes, let's jump into the topic. Yeah, we have limited time, and I think Florian was perfectly right. Uh, uh, we will move on the topic and, and guide you through Mika. <laughs> okay, jump in. So uh, first of all, uh, let's um, have a brief overview of our topics and what we're going to talk about. Uh, at first, we will give you a brief overview of the market and the tokenization process um, in the market, and we will um, provide you with the interpretation of the business models which we uh, identified in the market. This will be followed by a quick overview on the regulatory side, but we touched that matter really uh, very in depth uh, uh, yesterday, so we will do it quickly. Yes, so, and then we will link the regulatory landscape to the elaborated business models, and um, yes, we'll, we'll show you the consequences um, of each business model and the, the token type um, the business model is operating in. And uh, we will close our presentation with an outlook and um, yes, um, um, provide you with the further challenges in this market. Key features. Okay, um, to give you a sound understanding of what we're talking about, we're talking about the voluntary carbon market. The counterpart of the voluntary carbon market is, is the compliance market. And we are just talking about this voluntary carbon market. Um, the voluntary carbon market focuses on the issuance of carbon credits. And uh, our understanding of carbon credits is... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a magic number in the VCM market. And it says that usually one carbon credit equals one ton of avoided, removed or sequestrated CO2 in the atmosphere. Yes, and the uh, carbon credits are often linked to a um, register like a VERA or Gold Standard. I think um, these registers are well known in the market. So. Um, that's, that's our standard in a way, and um, in this development of the VCM, we, um, we identified some deficits, and uh, in th this relates to traceability and trustworthiness, and the tokenization process uh, tries to mitigate these deficits, and I think it's um, a good measure to, to avoid these, these deficits, and the whole process was um, stressed by uh, Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, um, which determined that um, the national member states should implement a register, so a governmental register, to, um, to uh, sum up this um, voluntary carbon market, which is um, in kind of private economy at the moment. Let's talk about classification. What you can see above is our own classification. There is no official classification yet, but we backtested this with quite a few market participants, so we think uh, it's quite adequate uh, to talk about the business models and the regulatory plane, which follows from those business models. Yes, and we identified um, two core types of token, which are uh, the carbon credit token and the carbon offset NFT. And the carbon credit token had some subcategories, um, which are carbon credit backed token, native carbon credit token, and carbon forward token. Um, the main difference between the carbon credit token and the carbon offset token is that the carbon credit token is linked to a real register and the um, carbon credits which are registered like are at a VERA or gold standard and um, you can choose between um, pulling that, that uh, carbon credits into SPV and uh, or you, you link just between the token and the, the uh, unit which is registered at VERA for example. And the carbon offset NFT uh, is a unique token and um, yes, it's very uh, close linked to a real object. So um, there's always the link between, the unique link between the token and the, the object. And um, as regards our subcategories, we have the um, carbon credit backed token, which is, um, uh, the token represents a real entry in the register and um, yes, it's, it's kind of a digital twin um, in a way. And the native carbon cro credit token is just um, that the, the carbon credit token is on chain, so the database is stored in the token or um, in the underlying smart contract. So it's solely on chain. 
And then we have the carbon forward token, and the carbon forward token represents or is underlined with a real contract, and there are various ways to structure this contract. Um, yes, so it's, um, it's uh, you have to, to decide case by case um, what this is all about. So yeah, I think uh, it's crucial that it has a binding nature on that obligation to provide some for some CO2 reduction in the future, or uh, whether it's a mere like a, a pledge or something like, but m nothing hard in contractual terms. Yes. So it's very close to the financial instrument forward, which we will explain later on. So let's have a look on the um, regulator, uh, regulatory environment. So at the moment, um, we are faced with a fragmented domestic legislation. We have no EU um, harmonization. And um, to the token categorization by BaFin follows, um, which we all know, <laughs> with the security token, payment token, and utility token. And the Lagos later um, uh, decided to give them a legal base with the term crypto -verd. And um, there were some remaining um, insecurities in, with regard to the um, interpretation of the term crypto -verd. And uh, BaFin published um, its administrative practice on the interpretation of crypto -verd and gave some guidance um, for like a practical approach. And uh, yes, we will uh, hopefully have <laughs> Mika uh, yes, with a EU-wide regulatory framework and the definition of um, crypto assets with its uh, subcategories. So. Yeah, and RT stands for Asset Reference Token, EMT is the e-money token. And for sure, uh, Buffin's early directory on the matter and the regulatory clarity gave the German crypto industry a head start compared to others. So that was something crucial and we have discussed it yesterday, but that's really a big advantage for the German market. Yes, so let's have a closer look to the token categorization of BaFin um, to have an estimation on the consequences linked to, to each token. So we're always referring to our CC token, which I pictured um, recently. Um, we have the payment token, it's uh, our currency-like token, um, for example, Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, and then we have security token, which are security-like tokens, so that represents um, rights that are very similar to those of bonds or shares. And then we have the utility token, which enables um, access to a good or a service um, supplied by the issuer. And um, to this token, there are uh, linked consequences, regulatory consequences. And um, yes, uh, just one step back, we, um, we focus on security token and utility token because um, we recognize in the market that the payment token is, uh, is not relevant. It can be deleted for <laughs> yes. our speech. So let's delete. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yes, and the security token uh, leads to the full application of EU and domestic um, legislation, which means that um, you have uh, authorization requirements and conduct of business uh, regulations to comply with um, EU, EU prospectus um, and distribution requirements, the, the whole scope. Um, yes, and as regards the utility token, you're generally uh, out of scope unless that's the important point. <laughs> it's considered as a crypto wert. Um, yes. So and if it's a crypto wert, the prudential supervisory regime applies. Uh, this triggers the AML uh, regime as well, but not the conduct, uh, code of conduct rules. So that is quite crucial, whether you are still in the crypto wert do uh, domain or really in the domain of a security token. And just for the sake of completeness, in very specific cases, also the so-called Vermögensanlagegesetz may apply, but that's always a case-by-case -case decision, and we leave it out here because we got only 20 minutes, so <laughs> we move on. Yes, so let's have a closer look to our CC token and what are the consequences um, when we consider them as utility token or security token, maybe. Um, the carbon credit-backed token as a token which enables a kind of access to a real carbon credit is um, often um, considered as a utility token. And the same goes for the native carbon credit token. They're quite similar, um, except of the, the fact that it's not linked to a real carbon credit. So it's the same um, 
conservation. So um, let's focus on the carbon forward token. The carbon forward token, it's important to, to look at the underlying contract when you have a binding DETI to deliver a specific amount of um, CO2 or avoided CO2 or sequestrated CO2. It's more like a real forward as in financial un instrument. Um, so it's very close to the security token. So it's a case by case decision. And uh, in the case of that the contract um, determ determined that it's just a loose promise to deliver a specific uh, CO2 um, amount, it's not recognized as a forward in this way. So there is no binding um, duty to deliver. So that's the key point. I think it's always worth to have a look at the legacy world. And if you think of the futures markets, that it's something binding and not a mere promise. And if you keep this in mind, you know whether it's a security token or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, the carbon offset NFT is very close to this, um, yes, to, to give the access or to enable the access to this specific object or to a specific good, like a tree, which is able to sequestrate a, a specific amount of CO2. So that's um, a kind of utility token by nature. So that's the consequences as regards our uh, token categorization by Baffin. So yep. we can keep in mind that, um, yes, it's, we are with the um, consideration as a utility token, you're outside of scope. And the important point was, unless it's considered as a crypto wert. So let's jump into the term crypto wert. Victoria, I think that is the most important slide beside yes. the Mika slide, huh? <laughs> yeah, so we will focus on that. Um, the term crypto wert um, uh, was added to the family of the financial instruments uh, in 2020, and um, for matters of prudential supervision, but not in terms of market product supervision. And um, to be considered as a crypto wert um, uh, leads to mandatory authorization, processes or requirements and um, the applicability of AML requirements in case of um, financial service provision in relation to this crypto vet. So it's important to know that the issuer is kind of out of scope, but when you're um, providing services, uh, these requirements become uh, important. And the key features of this crypto vet is the investment proposed and uh, the tradability. So these are kind of vague terms, so it, they need to be interpreted, and there were some insecurities in the market how to deal with these terms. And um, two weeks ago, I think, <laughs> Bafin published, <laughs> yes, published some guidance with its uh, administrative practice of how to interpret this term and these vague terms. And um, in the view of, of Bafin, they intended investment proposed um, manifested through contractual or sales documentation. So yeah, that, that is crucial. Yeah, it's not the, the, the subjective, speculative nature, the investment purpose, but uh, you have to look at the issuer, what the issuer says. And if the issuer says that's something for investment purposes, uh, that's, uh, it will be a crypto word then. Or if an intermediary uh, uh, like uh, says, oh, that's, that's something for investment purposes uh, in terms of marketing material. So always have a look whether you find something. It's not the subjective view of a single person, but what uh, is the attention of the issue. And the second point is the tradability. So you need a, a certain level of um, standardization, which requires homogeneity and um, the represented rights or assets must be um, issued in a considerable volume. So we need um, more than I think the, the edge is 1,000 token to be uh, issued to, to cross that, that line. Yes, so that yeah. gave us uh, yeah. more security in this regard. And you're not out of scope because of an individual token idea. This w wouldn't help. Buffy, Buffin clarified this. So uh, don't think of like projects using different token IDs as such. It wouldn't put you out of scope anymore. So you need unique uh, features and um, the ERC 721 standard could be helpful, but you need these unique features. That's important. And uh, yes, and the, the quite small volume of the, of the uh, token issuance. So as regards our CC token, uh, what are the consequences? Um, when we look at our carbon credit backed token, it's quite obvious that they uh, will be issued in a considerable manner and um, 
the, the investment purpose is kind of intended because you want to, to offer a product which is kind of tradable and which um, will be, um, yes, for the, for the in investor, uh, it must be a kind of, there must be an investment purpose in a way. So that's a clear direction in the, uh, uh, yes, to, to consider it as a crypto bet. And the same goes for the native carbon credit token. Um, because they're quite similar. When we look at the carbon forward token, they are very close to a security token, so they're quite near this edge <laughs> to be considered as a crypto wert. And um, either- If they're not considered as a financial instrument. Yes, on the either financial instrument or crypto wert, so you're uh, mostly not out of scope. So <laughs> let's see what, uh, what, the, the, what the practical view is on that yeah. topic, but yes. When we look at the carbon offset NFT, um, it's yes, it's important that it's a unique um, token to be out of scope and um, the the small volume. So yeah, it's it's, an, it's not part of a collection. Yeah, so um, yeah, it's a case by it's a so, case by case decision. Yes, and you have just a small loophole to be out of scope. Yes, as a consequence. Okay, so how things are changing when uh, with, with Mika, we have with Mika a single rule book uh, which enables EU passporting and uh, we have a comprehensive definition of crypto assets with its subcategories, which yeah, we all right. know. And uh, it, or Mika establishes regulatory requirements very similar to MIFID 2, um, which are the base requirements for utility token and other crypto assets. And this uh, leads to authorization um, requirements for CASPs, uh, white paper publishing requirements, and conduct of business obligations, and MRE provisions. For the issuers as well, yeah. Yes, and uh, the increased requirements linked to RRTs and EMTs are um, that you have authorization requirements for the issuer. That's important. It's not only for the CAS, but um, for the issuer itself and uh, the obligation to own funds and um, to, to have re a reserve of assets, and um, that's, that's quite uh, broad. Mm. And we have also some exceptions in Mika um, as regards NFT, but um, must provide it that they are not part of a large series. That's also a vague term, so what's the meaning of <laughs> large series? Could be anything. <laughs> uh, or a collection, and um, the represented assets or rights uh, must be unique. And then uh, we have an exception for uh, financial instruments because they're, um, they're um, yes, in the, the MIFID II regime, so yeah. other. And, and DeFi protocols are uh, outside the scope, but there's a revision uh, clause baked into the regulation, and, but this applies only to fully decentralized systems. And if there is an intermediary, invo intermediary involved, you're caught by that uh, uh, regulation. And please keep in mind, that the, the token uh, definition is quite broad. So um, this is really something you should keep in mind. And utility tokens are covered irrespective of an inherent uh, investment purpose. So it's much wi wider than the domestic German definition. So um, to have that in mind, we look at our token, our CC token there, Mostly under Mika, they will be regulated, so there will be no loophole anymore, or just a small loophole. So you have to keep in mind that there will be the, regu the regulator will enter uh, your product <laughs> in a way. So uh, you should be aware of these consequences. That's a very important point. Um, so to sum it up, we uh, have with the CC tokenization still some insecurities, some uncertainties, and Mika will uh, mitigate some uncertainties, but there, we have to wait to level two or three measures to, to have more um, clarity in this regards, and we want to motivate the whole market to, yes, to enter um, the, the regulatory plane as a vital step to hedge um, against the uncertainties and to avoid the negative consequences of an unauthorized business and to contrib contribute standardization and to build a, a robust market with an attractive um, product for investors, um, private investors uh, and institutional investors, and to have a tradable and liquid uh, market. I think in essence, if you want to appeal to institutional uh, investors, there's no way out. Prepare for the regulation and do it in time. Thank you very much. Thank you.